Today's episode of The Watch is brought to you by Just Crack an Egg. Has your relationship with breakfast felt strained lately? Is it just too much work for a weekday, right? Well, it's time to head over to the egg aisle and pick up Just Crack an Egg. It's a hot, fluffy scramble that's ready in less than two minutes. Just add a fresh egg over chopped veggies, shredded cheese, hearty meat, and potatoes. Then stir, microwave, and reignite your love of breakfast. Today's episode of The Watch is brought to you by Navy Federal Credit Union. The flagship rewards credit card offers three times points on all travel purchases and two times points on everything else. Three times the points on travel means getting rewarded while road tripping or even commuting to work. You'll also get other benefits like a statement credit for global entry and TSA pre-check of up to $100, 24-7 stateside member support, and access to Navy Federal's online shopping center. Check out NavyFederal.org for more information and to apply now. Message and data rates may apply. Visit NavyFederal.org slash flagship for more information insured by NCUA. Hey guys, thanks for listening to today's episode of The Watch. On today's show, I talked to Sean Fennessy a little bit about the closing of the streaming service Filmstruck and the release of the new movie from Paul Dano called Wildlife, starring Jake Gyllenhaal and Carrie Mulligan. It is one of my favorite movies of the year, so I just really wanted to talk to Sean about that. But the big news is that on today's show, I was joined also by Matthew McFadden. Yes, Tom from Succession. Henry from Howard's End was here. He was so nice enough to stop by. We talked a little bit about Succession, Succession Season 2, and the way in which the television industry has changed over the last few years in relation to England and America and more shows being co-productions and co-releases on both sides of the Atlantic. So obviously, it was just such a pleasure to have Matthew stop by. Check out today's episode, and we'll be back on Monday. I need support to have to clear the room. Stand up and walk now. now. Hello, and welcome to The Watch. My name is Chris Ryan. I am an editor at TheRinger.com, and joining me in the studio by very own film library, it's Sean Fantasy. Hello. What's up, man? Host of The Big Picture, now with its own feed. Yes, please Sean, subscribe. congrats. Please subscribe. The Big Picture is an incredible podcast about movies, and there's actually some new bells and whistles on it. Yeah, we're going to be doing a few new shows. Uh, Amanda Dobbins and I are going to be hosting a weekly Oscar show starting next week. And maybe you'll be a part of it and doing some shows with us. Uh, Bill Simmons and I just this week did a streaming horror show. I think we'll try to develop some kind of streaming show that we get for people going every week with some members of The Ringer. And it's exciting. Do you and Amanda have a cool name for it yet? Like statuesque? Uh, <laughs> wow. That, that's certainly better than anything we've come up with, which I think is just at this point quote unquote the Oscar show. Okay. Um, <laughs> but I'm just, I'm leaning into SEO in 2019. Good, good. That works for everybody. Sean, maybe Filmstruck should have leaned into SEO. Woof. Uh, this is now. This is a kind of a niche conversation that I think winds up being very important. We're recording this on a Friday, so today we found out that the f- streaming film service Filmstruck was going to be shuttering in about a month. For those of you who don't know, Filmstruck was a streaming service that essentially drew from classics, foreign films, indies, and it was like a film school. Basically, and you could you could go through it. You could create your own watch lists that you were going to go through. You could sort by director. You could dive deep into Italian cinema. They had these great playlists of different films, like whether it would be sort of like fifties noir or women in trouble, or like it had like these very creative playlists of movies. Uh, it was owned by Warner Media, which was recently obviously acquired by AT and T. Uh, and then today they announced that they were shuttering it. They would be shuttering it. And, you know, there is some talk and suggestion that a lot of the Filmstruck library will be subsumed by a uh, over-the-top Warner Media service. And I guess we can only hope that a lot of these titles do find a place there. But I think it speaks to a couple of things here. One is, what are we going to do with the stuff that we love if it goes away? Right? We're going to forget about it, yeah. unfortunately. And that's, 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 that's a much more existential conversation mm-hmm. about being a lover of culture in 2018 and, and you know, what does ownership mean? Uh, what do these subscriptions really pay for in the end? If you, uh, if they could be taken away at any moment. It's one thing if Google Reader goes away, you can still read the internet. For a lot of people in a lot of different places, Filmstruck might have been the only access they had to movies like this in, in a lot of ways. Yeah, you and Andy have talked many times on this show about the overwhelming power of choice that we have right now with TV shows, with music, and Spotify. You can discover anything you want. If you want to pull up the most obscure, least successful Rolling Stones record, you can listen to it all day, every day, all weekend if you want to. And that was much more difficult Mm -hmm. 10, 12, 20 years ago. But I think of a place where you used to work, Kim's Video. Yeah. 
and a place that I used to haunt all the time, especially in my early 20s, because it was the li- I didn't grow up with a cool video store in my neighborhood. So that was my first real cool video store in my life. And the way that they organized everything at Kim's in the in the video and DVD section was by director. Yeah. And that taught me a lot about how to think about movies. And it led to, in some ways, this podcast that I'm doing right now that we're talking about. And Filmstruck is the first time one of these big media organizations curatorially crafted something that led to this. It was the first time there was a, a, a sort of a digital iteration that, that told you these people matter. These people belong in a collection. This is a, a part of film history. And this is why it, this is why you should give some time to it. My watch list on Filmstruck, I think, has over 400 films in yeah, it. Yeah, I have 67 right now, which I think is going to be a little bit of a crunch to finish that. By well, yeah, what are we going to do? <laughs> uh, I mean, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm a firm believer in physical media, and I like to buy things, and I like to own things, and I, I am on a journey to own as many of the Criterion Collection editions as sure. I can. But one of the genius aspects of Filmstruck was it wasn't just obscure German cinema. It wasn't just, um, you know, Korean films that you can't find or no, Japanese films. it was the Turner Classic Library. Yes, yeah, so it had the big library. sleep and it had, you know, the Philadelphia story and it had Casablanca and, yeah. I have started treating that service. It used to be something where I was trying to learn and, and watch Ozu films I hadn't seen before and it is becoming a bit of a nightlight for me. It is yeah. becoming the place where I go to put on the Bogart movie that I like. Yeah. And so to lose that is a huge bummer. It's really disappointing. But I don't, I don't know, what do you think will happen? Do you think it will be part of a bigger well, conglomerate? Well, I, I had this funny moment this morning. Nothing about this is particularly funny, but I did have I I have a habit of essentially using my DVR just to tape Turner Classic movies, mm-hmm. and I was like, well, at least I have like about thirty or forty of these saved in my DVR. As if my DVR can't just fail. Same as deal. if one day I can just decide I don't use Spectrum. You know what I just mean? Just surfing on a cloud that could evaporate yeah, at any minute. So by that same token. DVDs can get scratched. You could lose them in the mm-hmm. move. You could drop a box of stuff in the bathtub. I have no idea. But to me, what the, the thing that I was really thinking about with this is that this conversation ultimately becomes about margins. Because you were talking about Kim's. Uh, we had a video store in Philadelphia that Andy and I, I'm sure, both went to different branches of. It was a small chain called TLA, also divided by director, but also divided by, you know, 50s B-movies, like Sam Fuller stuff, or, you know, 1960s French New Wave about with female protagonists. Like, it was very specific categories. And everybody worked there at $8 an hour. And the people who owned that place did not do it because they were trying to derive a huge return on investment from a group of investors or a board or anything like that. They weren't even labors of love, but one thing that I think that everybody from Bernie Sanders on will tell you about is that making a decent living is hard in this world and running a company that isn't aiming to become huge and isn't aiming to return huge amounts of money to their investors is increasingly impossible. And that's something that like Filmstruck was never going to be a huge movie, a huge money driver for AT&T or Warner or Time Warner when it was at Time Warner. And so for as much as you might want to do hashtags, save Filmstruck or, hey, Steven Spielberg should buy Filmstruck and just support it, the audience is the audience. And in some ways, I almost wonder, you know, well, probably there will probably be a return to a degree to piracy for these movies where you're just kind of trying to find them on torrent sites or whatever. There's a lot of open source libraries where you can kind of check these out. Canopy is one. There's a couple of, um, there's a couple of like, Actually, government-backed, I think. Open Culture is one where it's just like these are all just movies that have been decided that fair use you're allowed to watch. There's some on YouTube. But I don't think that this film history and film scholarship is not something that is like – it's not a a rich investment. And nor is the history of film does it support this kind of avenging socialist concept of art. I mean movies are made to be sold. They're popular entertainments. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't things in them that – transcend that but inevitably if if AT&T and Warner Media decide to shutter a service like this it's because they don't see value in the bottom line which yeah, is obviously the quote sad. here that's key is we plan to make the key learnings from Filmstruck to help shape future business decisions in the direct consumer space and redirect this investment back into our collective portfolios right which is obviously that's for shareholders you yeah. know that's a choice yeah. that is made for shareholders um i don't it, there's no good answer i remember when Netflix streaming first launched, you know, they bought a lot of catalog. They licensed a lot of catalog and they had a lot of old movies and they had a lot of obscure 70s films yeah. in particular that I really liked. Not movies that were great movies, but great movies that starred Chris Christopherson that I otherwise wouldn't have seen. And there is the version of film history that is 
these are Jimmy Stewart's best films. And then there's the version that is, you know, here are the Kurosawa films mm-hmm. you have to see. And then there's the things around the edges that are kind of mediocre but interesting and tell a story about an actor or a filmmaker. All of those things are valuable. It's like the seventh best Robert Ryan movie. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, you and I love that stuff and we're always talking about that stuff. But there's not one ultimate force mm-hmm. that can bring all of those things together and give us exactly what we need. So when Netflix starts shedding all of that catalog in an effort to build their own library, which they deem more valuable long term, you know, we we sigh and we lament. And when Filmstruck launches, we celebrate. And when it folds, we sigh and we lament. There's never going to be a time when someone solves this for us. No. There, no one's going to come in and say, I bought all the movies and I have created a master class for everybody and it is free. Yeah. That's not going to happen. But there is something upsetting and a little bit concerning about the idea of the movies vanishing forever. And the movies are not being produced anymore on these physical media. And if they're only behind these gatekeepers' walls and those gatekeepers don't have a real interest, because largely they have transformed into massive conglomerations. They're not studios. They're studios that are owned by companies that are owned by companies. Yes, yes. And there is a chance that a lot of stuff is just lost to time. That's, that, is, that actually is scary to me. And, and that, that, that's where it gets kind of back into you just kind of wonder whether or not I, – I don't know that we'll ever go back to having video stores or DVD rental places, but that it, there will be an act of pilgrimage to go see these movies rather than uh, you have them at the te- the – at, at your fingertips, which is disappointing because I think that the one of the best things about Filmstruck is like, if I had a weekend to kill, I could watch three Antonioni movies and come back on Monday and be like, guess what I did this weekend? I watched three Antonioni movies. And that's, there's a certain ease of use to Filmstruck that was so, so great. Whereas with video, you know, video stores involve physical acts. They involve like, well, I got to watch this in the next two days or they're going to charge me $5 a day and all this other stuff. There's still a few places in the world where you can experience old movies in that curatorial way. Like if you, every time I go to New York, I make at least one trip to the Metrograph, mm-hmm. which is the recently opened repertory theater. And you can also still go to Film Forum in Los Angeles. You can go to the Egyptian or the Arrow or one of these great old movie houses that tend to show Lawrence of Arabia. Or you know, last month during Beyond Fest, there was a Cronenberg retrospective, and they showed 20 Cronenberg movies. And that's great. But those are small contained experiences. And the mastery that we have in other places where we can now see every TV show on Hulu and Netflix and hear every record on Spotify, we're losing in movies. It's yeah. vanishing. So it's scary. Yeah, it's it's terrifying because, like, you know, when it, I think that the promise of the Internet is the digitization of, of information, right? That was what Google was supposed to do. It was supposed to digitize knowledge. And we've now obviously gotten to a point where it's not about that. It's about sort of deriving money from knowledge and deriving money from intellectual property and deriving. And what is, if this is just for the collective good, for the cultural good of a society, you know, I would love to see one of these companies that have nothing but money to burn take the hit and be like, it's important that people be able to see movies that were instrumental in building Western culture. It's interesting, too, because you've seen a lot of kind of billionaire types get involved in the movie industry. Obviously, there's been a lot of conversation around Megan Ellison and Adam. Yeah. in the last few months and there are benevolent figures but those people very rarely are in, and, and, and and Megan Nelson to her credit saved uh, you know one of the video stores in Los Angeles that is dedicated to this video but there, the idea of coming in on a grander scale and trying to own this m- these massive catalogs and make them available to every, everybody in a complete way one other thing I want to say about Filmstruck it was really well built oh yeah you know, it was easy to use. Great UX. It made yeah. sense. Yeah. And most of these things, as we know, are not like that. You guys have talked about how Amazon, for example, is probably struggling in the face of Netflix, largely because their interface just isn't as helpful. Yeah. And there's something lost to just not being able to easily find stuff. It's a shame. A movie that I wouldn't be surprised if Filmstruck had gone on forever would wind up on Filmstruck is Wildlife. Um, and Paul Dano, who directed Wildlife, is the first guest on this new iteration of Big Picture the, on the new feed. Uh, and I saw this film, and I just wanted to have you on also to talk briefly about this movie because I think it's one that we both really treasure. And that for as much as the conversations on both of our podcasts are about intellectual property and like how different cinematic universes and what are these industry-wide trends that we're watching and what's the narrative of this award season or that— this is probably a movie, with the exception of Carrie Mulligan, that will not compete majorly for any of the big Academy Awards. Uh, that can be considered a shame or not. I, I, I really encourage anybody who's hearing my voice to check this movie out. Um, it is really, really one of those like very moving observations of humanity that only the movies can do. When I was talking to Paul about it a, a couple of weeks ago when he was here, 
he was trying to figure out how to describe the movie, and he was searching around, and he was looking for the right word. And then he just said, it's a drama. Yeah. <laughs> and, it, you know, once upon a time, this seemed like a very obvious conceit. And we talk all the time about how there are just fewer and fewer films like this made. This movie is distributed by IFC. It's a very small movie, but it seems a lot bigger for a couple of reasons. One, it's got Jake Gyllenhaal and Carrie Mulligan, big stars. Two, it's based on a Richard Ford novel. It's crazy, but there's I don't think there's ever been a Richard no, Ford adaptation. No, they did Sports Writer Independence Day. I mean, that's wild. Yeah. And so th- there's that. And three, it's, you know, Paul and, and his partner, Zoe Kazan, co-wrote this movie. So 20 years ago, or 30 years ago, if this were Robert Redford and Jane Fonda wanted to star in a movie like this, and it was adapted by Jack Nicholson, who wrote and directed it, you'd be like, this is one of the biggest movies of the year. Yeah, this is a big deal. And for whatever reason, it's not that. Nevertheless, uh, it's it's beautifully made. Yeah. Um, it's clearly made by somebody who is obsessed with movies, who is thinking about, and I was trying to get to the bottom of it when talking to Paul about you know, how he composed the movie and it's it is painterly at times and it looks amazing, but that sounds pretentious. No, it's never it's ostentatious. Not like that. It's it's got moments of of real period detail and um, basically mirroring the interior lives of the characters with the exterior of Montana where it's set. And this like I think at one point Carrie Mulligan talks about you know how could you leave me in the loneliest place in the world, uh, and he shows that it's it's a real show don't tell movie. The book, which I think Sean and I both adore has a lot of uh, knowledge gained with experience in the narrator. It's told from the perspective of a teenager, but is imbued with the perspective this guy has now years later. That gets taken out of the movie. It's only from this kid's perspective. And it's basically just about a family falling apart. Yeah, and and Paul changed some things about the movie, specifically the ending, which we won't spoil. But he, he made a very modest change that I appreciated, which is he shifts the character in, in the main character from 16 years old to 14 years old. And there is a significant difference in your life between 16 years yeah. old and 14 years old and the way you see your parents and the things that they do and why they do them. And, you know, we can say just this movie is essentially about a marriage and a family kind of very slowly coming apart and why. And, yeah, I, I really hope Paul makes more movies because he has a real knack for small sensitive moments and he also has an ability – to transform what could be obvious bad metaphor yeah. into something a little bit more subtle. Because wildlife, if you if you were uncharitable, you could be like, this movie's trying to do a lot with the idea of fire <laughs> yeah, yeah. and desolation and, you know, America at the, in, in this sort of like suburban exurb growth. Yeah. Um, but he, he does it with a very light touch. Yeah, it's, it's interesting that you mentioned that at the end because one of the things that he really brings out is that it could be 2018 or it could be 1938 or it could be 1960, and you just kind of are watching that. And I don't mean this in a pejorative way against people who choose to live there. Or it, It's like maybe we weren't supposed to build stuff out here. Mm. You know, <laughs> like there's just a feeling of like, why did everybody come here? Like this is just like this wide open desolate place, and it's physically very beautiful, but they're, like everybody seems to be looking at each other like, what the hell are we supposed to do out here? It's funny. That's been a common theme in movies this year. Yeah. You know, that's definitely a theme in Hold the Dark, the Jeremy Saulnier yeah. movie. It's there's definitely a theme in The Ballad of Buster Scruggs, the new Coen Brothers movie that's coming out, which is essentially about a lot of people in the West in the 18th century and 19th century and kind of what they're doing there. Yeah, There's something about feeling unmoored from <laughs> where, where we think we're supposed to be and where we actually are yeah. that maybe feels like a little bit of a broad idea. But, you know, again, we're doing kind of what you don't have to do to make – wildlife feel special, you know, even just on its own terms. Just the story. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, I mean, people can listen to your conversation with Paul Dano on The Big Picture. Please subscribe to that. And obviously, Sean will be back soon. Thank you, Chris. Today's episode of The Watch is brought to you by an all-new season of the Showtime original series, Ray Donovan, starring Liev Schreiber, John Voight, and Susan Sarandon. LA's top fixer has left Hollywood and all of its dirt behind. But New York City has its own seedy underbelly, and Ray is quickly lured back into buying the secrets of the powerful and political. His professional and personal turmoil threaten to drag him down, but Ray always finds a way to take control. Keep up with all the action on your own terms. Stream, download, or watch it live. Just be sure not to miss out. The new season of Ray Donovan premieres Sunday, October 28th at 9, only on Showtime. To try a free month of Showtime, go to Showtime.com and enter code The Watch. This offer is for free. First time subscribers only and expires October 31st. Today's episode of The Watch is brought to you by Microsoft Surface. Let's talk about something super exciting. 
like the new member of the Microsoft Surface family, the Surface Pro 6. Now faster and more powerful than ever before. So you can get even more done, whether it's from your office, at the airport, or on your couch. Take the keyboard off and draw on it easily, or snap it back on and type on it like a laptop. With up to 13 and a half hours of battery life and the new 8th gen Intel Core processor, you can work how you want to for as long as you want to, wherever work takes you. Okay, now I am joined by Matthew McFadden, star of Succession and Howard's End. Thank you so much for joining me today, man. Welcome. So Thank I you. think that in terms of probably collective approval rating succession is is definitely like this podcast's favorite show of the year. Really? And it is certainly the favorite show of the website that we work for, The Rare. So okay, it's quite yeah. an honor to have Tom in the flesh here, you know? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> have you found that people, especially in the States, recognize you for that role now? Well, I haven't been here in long enough after the uh, to know to notice. Yeah. But there's been a really nice reaction from friends. You know, you become aware of it. A lot of actors who I haven't seen for ages. You know, we get, actors sort of jump around a lot, and yeah. you, you, it's easy to lose touch. And um, to actually, you, I've got so many friends I haven't heard from from years, and they got in touch because they've seen the show. So it's quite a. That's very nice. That's oh, almost like a class reunion kind of thing. Though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it doesn't always happen, and I think it's. Um, it's quite an actor's show, I think. Yes. Because it's not, it's not one big star. It's not a star vehicle. It's, not, it's an ensemble piece, and the writing's really good. I, we wanted to have you on because of Succession, but I mean, you also managed to pull off this miracle where you're in Succession and Howard's End in the same, same year. They're fa- and, uh, <laughs> fairly different. But two of the best shows of the year. And oh, I was wondering, if you, you. chronologically, can you break down when you shot which? I shot the pilot for Succession. We were in November 2016, I think. After the election. On the eve of the election, oh. so, the, so the read through, the table read of the pilot was the day of the election. Okay, the night of the. So we went to Adam McKay's house for a sort of party gathering to watch <laughs> uh, Hillary win. Yes, of course. Yeah. <laughs> and then the evening sort of went. Yeah. And everyone started checking their phones and wandering off into the night. And so that was the day of the read through. And then we came back a couple of weeks later and shot the pilot. <laughs> and I was in a. I was in the trailer somewhere waiting to be called to set and I got my uh, how was then ping through on my email uh, and they said they'd love to offer you this and so I remember exactly and then I went and then I shot that in the new year oh wow and yeah. then you came back and did the rest of succession exactly yeah oh gosh so yeah. that must have been pretty head spinning to go from such different material like that but I guess that's what TV is lovely. now yeah. Yeah, yeah 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 no that's the joy of it you know yeah. just jumping from different characters to different characters so if I had to make a stretch and mm. sort of find thematic cohesion between the two projects, which I'm sure you weren't necessarily looking for when you took them, obviously they're really great opportunities, but they're both in, so, in their own ways about class, I think, in, in some ways, and about the aspiration and about yes, the limitations. They they're of, about money, yeah. power, men, That's, and men and women. Yeah, yeah. Yep. I mean, they're about human beings. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, but, I, but the, yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, but I think that I always, you know, my father was British and I grew up and as an American, I always thought that the English were very, not consumed with, but concerned by the issues of class, you know, that, that the class system, oh, yeah, in, especially in the post-war era, if not before that, were very rigid. Did you see a lot of resonance in the material when you were looking at that? And especially for things that are taking place in such different time periods and have such a different uh, circumstances. In how it ends. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. It was so brilliant. It's, it's such an amazing book because Forster writes about that stuff so elegantly mm-hmm. and well, it's kind of artlessly, and you re- and he says an awful lot without sort of being tub thumping about it yeah. or um, didactic. You know, he talks about what you do with your money and your responsibility and your social responsibility and yeah. your. Uh, you know, I was fascinated by Henry Wilcox because he was, you know, he was a man of his time and everything, but he was his attitude to women was very different. So that was all fascinating. He's a real interesting character where, you, you know, you, you, you often, if you're reading an older piece of literature and you'll talk about it with somebody, and we're like, well, this person is a product of their time. Yeah. You know what I mean? He's, he definitely seems Absolutely. to embody that. Yeah. But he was a gentleman. I mean, yeah. Like a real gentleman, you know. And then not in some ways. It was, yeah, very, very interesting. In terms of working on those two pieces, because I would imagine that Lonergan's stuff is so precise and that he, you know, it's a, it's this very yeah. worked over and there's no word wasted and there's no word out of place. And is there no. a demand when making something like that to hit all the right notes and it's almost Shakespearean in terms of like how you're executing it? Well, you it? just want to because it's yeah. so beautifully constructed. And he would, Kenny would do this thing where he, you'd, he would construct a scene, we'd write the scene 
so we were interrupting each other. You know, mm-hmm. sometimes you'd have five or six characters sort of interrupting each other on the word. So we'd rehearse it like people do in life, yeah, you know, yeah. without talking over each other, but they're just cutting into each other sort of precisely. So we'd rehearse and rehearse and rehearse this before we should. And it would be very satisfying, and I think it worked really well. Yeah. But it was quite specific. You know, it wasn't sort of, oh, I'll give it a whirl and see how it comes out. We sort of worked it out like a dance. Yeah, absolutely. But then I, from what I understand about the way you guys shot Succession is that there was a sli- it's slightly different. There's the page. It's looser. But again, the writing is so brilliant. Yeah. It's so sharp and funny. It was so brilliant. Uh, we, you know, you were sort of overflowing with options. And then the writers, would they would always be sort of, there would be w- one or two writers minimum on set all mm-hmm. the time. And so we was Jesse on set ninety nine percent of the yeah. time, yeah. And if it wasn't Jesse, it would be Tony or Lucy or Jonathan Glatz or any any of you know all these guys. And they would come in with we'd shoot the scene as written, and then they would come in like coming in with Christmas presents. They would come in with alternate lines, sure. And you'd have two or three, usually kind of filthy, really pushing it, yeah. <laughs> and it would be like a little present for getting through yeah. the scene. Yeah. So it was wonderful. So you went. I it, it was just a really lovely thrilling atmosphere to be in, you know. With that that in mind, I was wondering about, because I know that Adam shoots in blocks, or at least that's yeah. like the format. that He sort of started it with the big short, and I know it kind of uh-huh. went, came over to um, Succession, where it seems like maybe there's more than one camera going at once, and you kind of have free reign within the room to do different things because they yeah. can cover you. Is yeah. that freeing? Is that like pretty exciting to kind Supremely of... Supremely yeah. freeing, yeah. yeah. You don't... You, you and, and it takes away any kind of fear of getting it right you right. know there's that terrible because like fucking thinking. up is kind of part of it then right exactly yeah exactly and you yeah you think well i had you know often it's like okay let's turn over okay ready get it right you know and it's quite stifling that and yeah. actually if you um it's like having an, a director i worked with a long time ago always had an end board uh-huh. instead of it so you'd sort of just the camera would turn over and you'd just begin and then you'd put the board on the you know or you, you'd put the board on the end end of the take instead of at the Clapping beginning, the so beginning, it wouldn't yeah. be like an intake of breath. And yeah. let's go and not fuck it up, you know. So, I was sort of wondering that because there's a the scene where you're about to tell Greg about the death pit, you know, you're about to tell him <laughs> about the cruise, and there's I, I'd forgotten because it's such a funny scene. The dialogue is so perfect, but I forgot how much the time virus. you're forced to kind of st- you're looking through the window, but like I don't think your blinds can close, <laughs> and then you're just kind of. You're going through about every single emotion a human being can go through yeah. in that scene, and they let it play out like the whole time. It's not yeah. just like Greg enters and you're there. No, and you're no, like, no. I'm going to screw you right <laughs> yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I actually headbutted the glass door, <laughs> and after and I got an egg on my forehead. Oh my like god! I got a bump. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, uh, Adam Arkin, the director, said, "What is that, dude? You've got a big, you know." <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I had to put the ice and all the rest of it. It was ridiculous. Um, I know you've talked before about how you and, and uh, Nicholas used to just crack yourselves up and that it was you, yeah. you were the ones who it were really... It was a challenge. It was a real It's a real challenge. I'm sort of terrified for season two, just getting through scenes. Yeah. It became, you know, it was bordering on the unprofessional. <laughs> <laughs> had you ever... Do, are you, do you crack usually? Are you usually Hopelessly, pretty good? Oh, really? Time. Yeah, yeah. I'm congenital. I'm just... I can't... Once I've kind of got the... It's that sort of whiff of laughter. I it's really difficult for me. Is it to, regardless of the material? Like on MI5, are you cracking up? Or? It's usually, well, no, it's kind of, sometimes the really serious stuff is the most funny. You yeah. Know? And usually it's a sort of delight in the other actor. Yeah. Because they're, they're so good. You, you know, they're being, you, they're being so brilliant. I sort of just, I'm thrilled by, <laughs> I'm genuinely amused by them. So. Is Nicholas the kind of guy that you would, I mean, did you know him before the show started or did no. you just only got to know No, him? I didn't know anybody. Yeah. yeah. I knew Brian a little bit. I'd met Brian Cox uh-huh. over the years. Yeah, yeah. In that pilot episode, the during the softball game, there's mm-hmm. a line that you have. It's, it's something about, oh, I may look really fun, but the thing about it is, is I'm a terrible, terrible prick. Yeah, yeah. And when you deliver that line, you know, the pilot, and Andy and I talked about this a lot on the podcast about how Succession starts out and you think you know what you're watching and you think you kind of have a sense of this is going to be a kind of funny melodrama about this rich family. And then there's just like these sort of moments where these characters show themselves to you and they're incredibly candid with each other. And that that moment during the softball game is when I think the light went on for me. (laughs) Do you remember reading the script and kind of having a similar feeling maybe? Totally. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because you just think, well, he's just a dreadful sort of sycophantic crawler who wants to be, you know. But I completely believe it. Mm Mm-hmm. Because I recognize that in myself, certainly. And, you know, you, you're, we're all different with different people all the time. And you, 
that's just the nature of human interaction. You know, you play different parts, and some more so than others. Yeah. But I think with Tom, that's the real pleasure of acting him because he's just different with everybody. You know. Yeah. And, and he's quite, and he's quite sweet. You know, he's well, quite he's sympathetic. Well, he's sincere and, about being. Yeah. Yeah. aspirational about that you know like he's very it, yeah it, and you just see like and he's revolting to people because he's afraid like <laughs> yeah. most people are you know bad behavior is usually a result of fear yeah and then, you know so, he's so worried that Nicola because the great character has that bloodline connection yeah. that that's going to somehow... well it's that yeah and he's and he's tall I think that worries because <laughs> I'm quite tall but yeah. Nick's really tall yeah so I think that you know that worries Tom and I think yeah there's just something chemical that unsettles him uh, about Greg, about cousin Greg, and I think, um, yeah, I'm. I'll be fascinated to see what they do with them both. Well, that's what I was going to ask. Is like, I was wondering what your experience was like watching it. Did you watch it week to week? Did you watch them all in a bunch? Do you watch yourself? I, I do, uh, sometimes I do, and I don't. When I first started acting, I watched everything, uh-huh. sort of rising horror and <laughs> delight, or a bit of sure. both. And now I kind of, I, I can give a, I can. You know, I don't mind. There's things I've done I haven't seen. Did, did, I did, like, does your wife watch Succession? Does she? Did, She's watched it. She yeah. loved it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it, I, I kind of it, it matters less to me. Uh, the the joy of the work is the doing of it. Sure. Not so much the watching of it. But I did watch this and I loved it. Uh, yeah. Because I was able to enjoy performances and you know narratives that I hadn't really been aware of. Mm-hmm. You know, you sort of. You are in the read through and everything, and then you, everyone splits and you do your little bits and pieces. But you know, seeing all the stuff with Kieran and you know Jay Smith Cameron and, yeah. and the you know the the stuff with it, it, just all the other storylines that was a real treat. Yeah, because I was wondering. I imagine that you make movies in a vacuum. You know, yeah. you're doing it, and then it, mm. it you can't really control what happens after that. No. Theater, I would imagine, is it's almost like playing sports. It's like on a night to night basis. Yeah, you're it's sort of gladiatorial. Yeah, like okay, here we go. But yeah, TV yeah. is work is like. Now everybody has like expectations of this succession. There's even an idea of like who Tom is and how yeah. like what will happen. And I That's wonder right. if that and ex- it's a sort of long. It's a different. There's a different energy to a movie. Movies are hard because you don't. It does. You're right. It does sort of exist in a vacuum. And but a, a lot. You know, long form TV. You sort of turn up on month four. You mm-hmm. know, episode seven and. People are looking, you know, you see the execs and everyone, oh, there's a nice mood and you think, oh, maybe it'll be good. Maybe yeah. Be, who knows, you know. And movies you never really know, I don't think, you know. Because you've done, so, I'm sure you've done movies where you're like, well, this is just going to be a blockbuster and it hasn't been in the Oh, the well, most case. of them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, totally. Or this is going to be hilarious and, you, you know, it's just dreadful, <laughs> yeah. dreadfully unfunny. Or, you know, it's it's always the way. It's a really it's a really peculiar thing. One of my favorite parts of Succession is, you know, oftentimes in television shows you'll get introduced to a group of characters and then they get kind of paired off. Or yeah. They'll have their subplots that take them away from this sort of core group. But Succession's, it's built into the sort of structure of the show that these people are constantly being forced together for these family. events. Yeah, It's family. It's family. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it must have been exciting to have it not only be an ensemble in terms of people carrying weight, but actually... Going up against these people in a huge, these big groups, yeah, yeah, and nerve wracking. Yes. That was that was sort of wonderfully nerve wracking as an actor because mm-hmm. you're sitting around a big family table in the you know in this Fifth Avenue apartment in the Thanksgiving, and you know they're great big long scenes. So it was really uh, it's easy just to allow yourself to feel the characters' nerves yeah. actually and get lost in that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And also, and I got a real insight. It was really fascinating. I got a real insight. There was a big boardroom scene. And we had about 30 background artists and uh, it was a big scene where Kendall does this brilliant speech. Jeremy Strong does this wonderful speech about eyeballs. Mm-hmm. And, uh, <laughs> I remember that, yeah. And, uh, and I got a sense of how intimidating and scary that corporate world oh, must yeah. be, actually. Yeah, yeah. And why people behave as they behave, you know, and why this sort of... Um, aggressive yeah 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 Yeah, it comes from because it's frightening yeah did you feel like making a presentation in front of 30 you know alphas oh yeah looking at you and I guess in the same way that an episode like Prague is like that too which is the the Bachelor Party episode oh yeah 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 yeah. Yeah. because it's like you're you're just kind of stripping away any of the pretenses of kind of morality or proper like proper behavior from these guys (laughs) yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, that definitely had the the iconic line of this season for me was the closed loop system. I, that was extremely It's become fun, quite yeah. a saying around our <laughs> office. 
um, we actually did a video uh, using succession quotes to explain different parts of the NBA for basketball. Are you kidding? No, okay. yeah, and we used closed system. Did it work? System. It, okay. It did. I mean, it was yeah. mostly just an excuse to rewatch succession <laughs> yeah, episodes. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, we yeah, used yeah. it to describe a team that hadn't uh, gotten any new players. Right. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Closed loop. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's just, oh, it's sort of heartbreaking. He's really trying to <laughs> try to put a positive spin on it. Um, I wanted to ask you a little bit about how things have changed uh, as an actor working, obviously, in England and in Hollywood. Like five or six years ago, even, it was, believe it or not, still kind of like illicit for people in America to get MI5 or Black Mirror. Or, oh, really? Okay. Yeah, Shadowline. Yeah, yeah. You'd have to actually kind of search hey, it out. Hey, the show. And, yeah, 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 you know, yeah. how are we going to find this because it's not on here? Yeah, and, yeah. But you'd hear about it in The Guardian or something like that. Okay. And now, obviously, there's all these co-productions and yeah. the release schedules and the release dates are much closer together. I was wondering, is TV different over there? Like, has it changed as the sort of merging of the two satellite industries a little it bit? It does feel a bit like every, it's less of a sort of jump, mm -hmm. you know, like bodyguards like, on now here. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Netflix. So you you know you do co productions with the BBC and I don't know stars. And, yeah, you know. So it feels more one playing field, I guess. Um, and there's just a lot. Yeah, happening. So what does I mean, that mean for lot. I mean, an it's actor. a good thing. Well, it's a great thing because yeah. there's lots happening, but there's also a lot of rubbish, you know. And there's a lot of stuff which will just sort of go to the equivalent of the video. Sure, shop, you know. But I think it's exciting. And it's great for the industry. I mean, it's great for everybody else as well. You know, for sure. the, you know, the I don't know, the caterers and the electricians and the, you know, the like Pinewood Studios is fully booked and right. you know, the it's great for the Well, they'll have Star Wars movies until yeah, yeah, yeah. twenty fifty yeah, now, yeah, yeah. yeah, right. So um it's exciting. But the standard the standard goes up, I suppose. So it's you know it has to be good. Which was, was there a feeling when you were say when you were working on MI five or something back at, back in the day that it was very separate or that it was just kind of off on its own? I remember being quite nervous about it because we were it was it it was uh, we were kind of we weren't aping but we were inspired a little bit by twenty four sure and that split screen stuff which was quite exciting yeah. at the time. This was two thousand and one yeah. just after um, September eleventh and uh, and so. It was like, oh, is this going to work? You know, um, and it did, and yeah. it sort of went for ten series, right? Yeah, and yeah. but that was like almost something like a that would be like the equivalent of like a cool band that you could only get the singles at certain shops. Oh, really? Okay. You know, yeah, I yeah, think yeah, so yeah, for yeah, a while yeah. there. I mean, yeah. Whereas now, I think A and E had it. Yeah, that's yeah. Right. Yep. But if something like that had happened now, it just sort of immediately be on. It Amazon. would just be in. The, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it changes it a little bit. It's weird because it's the same way. Where if you have that access to something, yeah, it doesn't have that almost like rarefied thing which no. I know is probably silly to hear no, no, about no no you're right yeah. you're right but as an actor you, I mean you really are I'm, I just feel in the dark actors are stumbling around from job to job I really <laughs> feel like that I've never met an actor who said oh yes it's all going to plan sure no, my yeah. strategy is working well uh, we can't wait to see you on succession season 2 uh, oh, I can't wait to start I think, yeah. it's, I think it's they want us back in January so is it going to be shooting in New York I think so okay. yeah I'm, I'm assuming so although yeah. they may send they may send Tom and Greg on an adventure. Okinawa. Who knows? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I would watch that show. <laughs> yeah, I would that, watch that yeah, show. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so East. much for joining me today. You're so welcome. Thank you. Treat. Thank you. Today's episode of The Watch was brought to you by an all-new season of the Showtime original series, Ray Donovan, starring Liev Schreiber, John Voight, and Susan Sarandon. L.A.'s favorite fixer has left Hollywood behind, but is still putting his unique set of skills to work for the powerful and corrupt in New York City. Political maneuvering, dirty cops, and family turmoil threaten to drag him down, but Ray always finds a way to get what he needs for himself and his clients. Don't miss the premiere of Ray Donovan Sunday, October 28th at 9, only on Showtime.